your weekly dose of Wayne's Comics. Welcome to episode 257 of the Wayne's Comics Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. This week, I'm glad to say I've discovered another great comics creator company, and that's Fierce Comics. In fact, this week, I talked with Ben Filipiak, Mike Shoykut, and Scott Reed from a really fascinating book that really grabbed me called Midwalker Lightbreed. It's out in trade paperback form. For $19.99, you get 124 pages. And the description is this way. Years after a serious injury that almost cost him his life, Joshua Fisher discovers he has the remarkable ability to cross partway into the ethereal realm, whereby he is enveloped in and can control amazing energies. And there's a lot more to the story about that, and we'll get into that during our conversation. We'll talk about the company, as well as the comic and how the concept came to be, and what it was like to work on this book, as well as the future of Midwalker and other projects these creators are working on. As always, there's a lot to get to, so let's get on with the show. It's great to welcome to the podcast Ben Filipiak, Mike Shoykett, and Scott Reed from a really wonderful book that I recently got to get into called Midwalker Lightbreed. It's from Fierce Comics. Let's see. Let's start out. Ben, how are you? Doing well, thanks. How are you? Good. And Mike, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Good. And Scott, how about you? I'm very chipper. I do that in order so people yeah, might have... Yeah, mix it up a little bit. Okay. I, I do that so people have an idea when somebody's speaking. If I don't necessarily say the name, they'll have an idea who it is that's talking. So, what I wanted to do is I've encountered Fierce Comics for a while, but I never got the chance to actually sit and read all the good stuff until this last convention when I ran into you guys again. And Ben was kind enough to share some files with me and give me the chance to read. And I, I'm going to have to buy paper copies of these now because I like them so much. But uh, why don't you, Ben, talk about what Fierce Comics is? Wow. Uh, it's an interesting question. It, the company started roughly eight or so years ago. And it was um, a couple of guys who got together, myself, Pat Batten, Rob Ryan, with the plan of... Uh, putting together our own properties and it kind of grew from there. I actually had another gentleman, Mike Foss there at the time and, you know, Pat and I initially got together we were starting to work with Scott here on Redneck Red. Then we met up with Rob and Mike and then the four of us got together to start what's become the larger Fierce Comics lineup, which includes The Maniacal Smile, Redneck Red, Midwalker, Hoof and Horns, and most recently, Hearst Load of Horror. Um, the titles are all organic, uh, fierce owned properties. You know, one of the principals within the company owns the rights to the characters and we don't necessarily publish anybody else's work. And, you know, that really was the whole background behind the thing was we wanted to produce our own stories, our own way and just kind of blossom from there. So are you guys Florida based? Uh, th- uh, the main principles in the business are yes, but we work with a lot of folks uh, that are outside of Florida Mike's a good example. I think you're in. Are you in New Jersey, Mike? I believe you're in New yes. Jersey. But yeah. don't hold it against me. <laughs> <laughs> so we aren't limited to just Florida. Scott's in Florida. I'm in Florida. The rest of the principals in the business are in Florida. But we work with others. Uh, others too. And one other question, I got, of course, I always have to ask: Why Fierce Comics? As far as the name? Yeah. When this and that actually goes back farther. That's probably 2003. When Pat and I were uh, Pat Batten and I were first discussing the Redneck Red concept, and we wanted to come up with a name for the company that was going to be uh, somewhat representative of something that's kind of cutting edge mm-hmm. and something that's marketable, you know. Uh, and there really are not many names that you could go to anymore. This industry's had so many different companies and so many different people doing this. We just had a difficult time, but then one evening I just stumbled across Fierce, and it made sense. And the URL was available, which was also good because to be able to grab FierceComics.com was another big benefit to it. So we just kind of uh, ran with it from there. 
Okay, well, that sounds good. Anything to make it your company stand out is always a good thing, and I think that Fierce is a good name for it. And it always catches my attention when I'm walking through conventions and I see your booths there. I always, of course, I always want to know why it's called things. Well, and that's good to hear because we put a lot of effort into trying to make sure that we do uh, stand out a little bit. We've tried to build a brand promise that includes knowing that we're going to go above and beyond. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of see it in our booth. We don't just show up throw a skirt on the table and lay some books on the table. You know, yeah. we've got the huge backdrop, the 16 foot high banner that you could see from across the show floor, you know, all the pull up displays. I mean, we try to go all out and we try to do that with the books too. We don't try to cut corners. We don't try to find the cheapest way to get things done. Now from a business perspective, that that makes things challenging, but I think the end result, when you're holding the book in your hand, you're reading and looking through the book, you realize it's a polished piece of work and it, it's not something that was done on the cheap. Right. Now, one of the things, of course, you guys have bountiful product. And, you know, to someone like me, it makes it a little difficult for me to kind of figure out what I want to get. And you have like a book that I saw that has like some samples of some of your titles in it. And I would highly recommend people to get into that. And and if you want to kind of figure out what you're going to be attracted to, you can go with that. But, you know, you folks at the booth, I thought were real helpful to me, too, telling me what kind of stories are in each book so that I kind of could tell which ones I was going to be interested in, which I think is great. So one more question, of course, about this is that you guys have a website, right? Oh, yes. Yes, FierceComics.com. Okay, so we do that. Now, are you guys on Facebook? Absolutely, yes. Okay, okay, so and Twitter and Instagram and okay. you name it. You're all over the place. Well, that's good. Yeah. Because you never know who's going to be on what anymore. So that's a good thing. So... The book that I was first drawn to when I, I sat down and read the first was your book is called Midwalker Light Breed. And Ben, you're the script and letter, so I'll get to these guys in a minute. But where did the story come from? Well, why don't you give sort of a TV guide version of what the story's about? Well, my short pitch on it is that it's about a guy who could exist midway between life and the afterlife. Mm-hmm. And that really is the essence of what it's all about. It's about this guy uh, who can get a taste of a heavenly experience without necessarily leaving Earth not leaving being alive, you know, I mean, he doesn't have to die to get there. Mm-hmm. And the idea I wanted to explore with the concept is what would somebody do in that case? Mm-hmm. If you had the ability to still be tethered to this reality, but to get a taste of what would be probably better than any drug experience you can imagine. Okay. Something that's beyond euphoric. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be addictive? Wouldn't mm-hmm. you want to get back to that? Wouldn't you want to do anything you could possibly to get more of that. And that's really what this guy does. Joshua, the lead character here, uh, you know, he is really addicted to this feeling and he kind of becomes a junkie for it because it's so, it's so euphoric. Mm -hmm. Which is called, of course, you've got surrounding characters, Megan, who's his girlfriend. You've got two ministers. Or Ava, actually. Oh, it's Ava. Ava. Oh, it's yeah. Ava. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I got yeah, my, yeah. My, my character screwed up there. That's Ava, right. and there's a real interesting relationship going on between the two of them. It's not always pretty. And, of course, that makes it fun to read. And you've got two different ministers involved, and they have very different points of view as to what is going on. And I've got one more question before I start talking to Mike here real quickly. Is this Midwalker thing, is that real, or is that something that you came up with for this comic? Well, I don't know anybody who has the ability to tra- to, okay, okay. <laughs> to exist midway between life and the afterlife. That'd be pretty cool because I'd like to talk to them. Mm-hmm. But it was a concept that I wanted to explore to try to play out what that would be like in a situation like that. So that's really the essence of it. And then those two, the priest and the pastor, you know, those guys, you could they almost have a Spock McCoy type of a relationship. <laughs> uh, you know, you've got one that's more emotional, flies off at the handle, and the other one who's very logical and thinks things through and they come from different theologies and because of that that creates conflict even though they're on the same team you know mm-hmm. essentially it creates a little bit of conflict that i stumbled upon in the writing process and really really fell in love with i love the dynamic between those two mm-hmm. and you mentioned the relationship between josh and ava and it's it's like any normal relationship not everybody gets along 100 mm-hmm. percent of the time and i like exploring that mm-hmm. in this book of course in comics relationships are almost pristine you know we've got things going on and relationships have to be perfect in order for things to happen but i, I never liked that that's why i was really intrigued by the relationship i thought it was kind of fun to see the fact that these two don't always get along 
And that did make it more realistic to me, which I really like. Good. Now, Good. I want to talk to Mike about the artwork, which I really liked. It's very dynamic. Really great drawings of people's faces and expressions. But the one thing I had to ask about was that sometimes it looked to me like, are these based on real people? You know, the, the images of, of people's faces? Because there's a lot of detail in it. And a lot of people in comics do less detail rather than more. But you're somebody who has a lot more detail a lot of the time. Is that how you did it, Mike? Did you base these on real people, or are they images you came up with? There is some photo reference work there, definitely. Most of it is my own interpretation of these characters. But some of them are based on you know, maybe like facial expressions, things like that I use reference for. Are they well-known people, or are they people you, you know individually? How did you choose who to pick? Um, I don't think any of them are well-known. And the people who I, I I don't really know because some of them are just kind of out of my head, but some of the faces I kind of had trouble with, so I needed somebody. Some of them actually my face. What I would do, I would just take pictures of my face and scan it into my computer and see what it looks like. So, like, even the female characters might look like me. <laughs> Okay, because I, I, of course, got to ask, <laughs> which ones look like you? Which one or which ones resemble you? It's not really resemblance. It's just the position of different facial features and how they interrelate next to each other. That's what I look for, but most of it is just drawing. I don't really have any particular technique. I just kind of draw until it looks good, and I just try to draw best as possible. Mm-hmm. And I agree that some of the comic books right now is steering away from the photorealism stuff, you know, started because of deadlines and things like that. But with this book, I had a pretty easy deadline. I mean, Ben was really kind to me. He allowed me all the time in the world to draw this. So I thought, I'm going to draw it the best way I can. Mm -hmm. And this is what I did. It's very cool. This is why it's so detailed and everything's so intricate. Yeah, that was. I, I love the way that was because, like I said, I'm I'm so used to ultra simple drawings. So when I actually got to see a lot more detail in it, it made the, the art pop off the page to me. And then even too, like the devil character, the, the demon, in there, boy, the detail on his face is amazing. I, I'm not used to that kind of detail in the comic. So I really was like, wow. Most on my face. <laughs> oh, now I remember the, the devil. The devil expressions is mostly me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've got to. I have to step in here. I didn't know that. That's awesome, Mike. I did not know. So <laughs> those um, those sinister expressions. I am now slightly uh, slightly afraid of you, my friend. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it really looks terrific. I have to say. I, you know, maybe you took pictures of your own face in order to get the expressions correct, but you got them right. I have to say, wow. When people do things and and people react. It's very, very realistic, and it just, you know, like I said, it pops off the page to me. I'm just, I was just completely drawn in. Oh, thank you. It's not only facial expressions, but it's also body language, too. Like, I t- sometimes I take a picture of, I just pose and take a picture of that and see how it comes out. I mean, this is just how I learned to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, everything has to be kind of proper and look right, or else I go crazy. <laughs> well, you're not the only one to do that. If I remember correctly, Alex Ross... Before he would do a painting, would like take a photograph, and he would often photograph himself. That famous drawing that he did of the Joker with Harley Quinn, that's him standing there, and he altered his own face to look like the Joker. But oh yeah, Alex Ross would hire models, and he would uh, do photo shoots and everything with the lighting and light sources and everything, and then he would paint from that. It's very cool. It really makes this book stand out, in my opinion. One of the things that got me into the story was the fact that I could you know, relate to the characters so easily and to understand the expressions and what they were going through. You know, you didn't have to have a little word block saying, you know, the, the priest was confused kind of stuff. We knew by looking at the facial expressions you were doing that that's what was happening with the person, which is really terrific. I just think that was real something outstanding about this book. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate you saying this. And let's move on to uh, Scott here at this point, because I want to talk about the color. As much as I like Ben's writing and Mike's art, your color, you know, use of color was really creative, I thought, too. You know, there were a lot of times, like, when you're, there's the, uh, uh, there's an accident where this truck runs into a, a car with, a per- with the people in it. And there's this choice of color that's really kind of interesting, purples in different places, kind of blurred color happening and stuff like that. 
did you attack this book with kind of a different perspective on wanting to use the color? Did you want to do something different with it? Not really. I mean, the way I approached it was Mike's art, which is great. It's like the main reason I wanted to do this book because he's a fantastic illustrator. So I, I was just like, yeah, I, I want to color this book. But looking at the way he draws, it's kind of there's a roughness to it. There's kind of a loose quality to it. And I wanted to kind of match that in the colors. I knew that I couldn't color it in a really slick, very polished kind of way that you see a lot of comics colored in. Mike's style sort of lends itself more to, you know, a rougher, kind of a rougher textured look to it. So I tried to, to really complement what he was doing, which is really all a colorist, I think, should do is you're complimenting the penciler. You're complimenting the inker. Well, I got to say, there's this one panel where Joshua is talking to the priest, and he's got his eyes looking down, and he's got yellow on his left side, and then it's kind of a darker, kind of almost a purplish blue on the right side. And I got this funny sense that I, I had a feeling you were trying to communicate that there's conflict between the light and the darkness within him at that point. Yeah, I, I try to look at what's going on in the story and determine if, okay, you know, is, is this a warm moment? Is this a cold moment? Is this a conflicted moment? So it's, that's pretty cool that you picked up on something like that. I try to intelligently look at what's happening and, and apply colors based on that. Mm-hmm. Well, I love Sometimes that. it's an accident, though. Sometimes oh. it's just... <laughs> well, you know, hey, whatever it turns out is great. Now, I talked about the demon before with him. But I thought your choice of color on the demon's face accentuated his drawing. There was like there's parts where it's a little lighter, and it just makes his white eyes just literally pop out of his head. Kind of looking at me because, and also he's looking at us, which is I, I, again that with Mike was a wonderful thing. He's looking in our direction, so I got the chills when I saw that. And I think the combination of the art and the the color just. You know, he's looking at, at me, basically, and I went, ooh, gee, you know, he, he sees me somehow through the page. You know, very animal man of it, the way that was done. So I kind of like that. But as far as, like, colors of backgrounds and, and nights and stuff like that, there's often a lot of shades, you know, because sometimes its shadows are just black. You know, there's not a lot of shading going on. But you use a lot of different blues and, and different shades of blues and indigos and things like that in nights like when they're shooting the TV sequences. I got a big kick out of that because I, it made it a little more realistic to me, the way that you did that. So again, all this artwork just pops off the page and working with the script, I just thought this was just terrific. The way that it yanked me into the story and I just had to keep turning the page to find out what's going on. Have you done a lot of coloring in, in these kind of circumstances or is this kind of a new ground for you to conquer it's kind of new i mean I, i've colored my own work in the past and i've always sort of treated it like it's just part of the job you know well i've penciled and i've inked it and now i've got to color it and it's just sort of the next stage and you know the process so it was really great to be able to you know not be behind the steering wheel on this and just be there in a supporting role and to really just dig into coloring. So I, I really enjoyed it just on that level. Mm-hmm. Did you find it, uh, you know, because most people want to be in the driver's seat. It's it's interesting that you say that you actually liked not being in the driver's seat for a change, get a chance yeah, to flex like, different muscles. I don't have to take, I don't, you know, you, nobody can blame me. So I can just, <laughs> it's all, I can just point to Ben and Mike. And, and just, <laughs> Well, let's get back to Ben. You talked a little bit about something I wanted to get into, and that is the, his addiction that Joshua has for it. You know, I have to say, I don't think, in my experience with religious things and spiritual things, to see a good thing be addictive was something that I was kind of taken aback by. You know, normally it's bad things, you know, drugs or, or other th- you know, terrible, awful things that we don't want to get into. You overeat or things like that. But to have something that was considered a good ability or a good connection be addictive, that was something I, I was not prepared to see. That concept, was that something you had in mind for a long time and brought it to use in the story? Or as you were writing the story, did that come out to you? Uh, no, it was there from the beginning. It, the, the idea of, of exploring this aspect of the soul, okay, you know, being able to know what that feeling would be like and only being able to 
assume, okay, or, you know, you know, I mean, biblically, what is anticipated and expected, but I mean, without actually being able to be there to feel that, to understand that, to put a character in the position of being able to experience that, you mentioned drugs or other addictions. I mean, th- those addictions are there because the end result is so pleasing, whether it's a good thing for you or not, you know, physically, the end result to that addicted person is that they like that pleasing feeling for whatever it is. And in this case, that pleasing feeling is the euphoria of being in that heavenly state for the character, for Josh. So, yeah, I mean, that absolutely was the cornerstone for the whole concept. Well, I was just shocked. I mean, I'm not used to that. You know, usually it's something really bad that people get into and they can't stop. But here's something basically good that the more he did it, the more he liked it. And I, I, you know, I don't hear that very much. So I thought that was a real creative thing as far as the story goes. But it's good, but it isn't for him in some ways. Because it's so addictive, it leaves him really drained. It's like he had some massive emotional release. And so when the demon grotesque, okay, and that name's there for, it's spelt the way it is for a reason. I'm I'm sure you probably picked up by the end of the book. Mm -hmm. But when that warrior demon, for lack of a better way to describe him, is hunting him down, He's weak because he's basically, you know, you know, he's like a junkie who's coming off of a real hardcore <laughs> experience. And so that addiction, in a way, doesn't necessarily help him in some ways, but it is something he can't seem to avoid or get away from. Mm. Which is, makes this all kind of bittersweet, you know. you got got something right. that can help other people, but it hurts you in the process. Right, so right. Like or it can affect your life in negative ways. Mm-hmm. So that, all yeah. that was really kind of cool. And one more question i got to ask you, too, before I, I talk to the other guys again, mm-hmm. is that the choice of a priest and a minister <laughs> yeah. was kind of interesting to me because the priest kind of took positions I thought that a minister might be more likely to have and vice versa. And so I was really kind of... Everything wasn't what I expected in this book. That was the thing I really, as I was going along, going, well, that's different than I expected. I like that. Was it, did you, (laughs) again, I was asking about drawings. Did you base these characters on people you know, as far as like their perspective on these kinds of things? Uh, The pastor is kind of, uh, it is based on bits and pieces of various pastors I have known. The priest you know, I, I grew up as a child, young child, in a Catholic environment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, later in life, moved to a more Protestant-type background or, or uh, experience. And it just, thinking back and, and just, you know, the priests that I've heard, they seem to be more like Father Bernard, who's in this book. They just seem to, I don't want to say parrot each other, but I mean, they seem to reflect that type of personality. Very calm, not very over-the-top not your TV evangelist type of person, you know what I mean? And that's why I really wanted to reflect that personality in that particular character and then juxtapose that against somebody who's a little bit more shoot from the hip, Mm -hmm. maybe throw the Bible at you kind of a pastor Mm -hmm. and just have fun with seeing how those two collide Mm -hmm. in the book, even though they realize that they're not enemies, they're just very different in their approach. Mm Mm-hmm. And that got to be fun. It'd be great if you could get back to Mike and Scott. I want to give these guys some time. I just have to say, I stumbled across what I think is a world-class team here with these two guys when it comes to the illustrations and the colors. And I tell you, I I never cease to get compliments on the visuals in this book. <laughs> Mike, the expressions, I'm glad, Wayne, that you brought that up because that is a consistent comment I hear is that the expressions on these people in the books, in the individual issues, and now the trade, it's just amazing how they can basically they can say the words without having to have the words there Mm -hmm. and then the colors i don't know if you if you have some time take a look at some of the stuff scott posts on facebook look at some of his other work from his other books i mean i really encourage you to check out his other books it's not just that he's doing colors he's actually i mean he is a talented painter in and of himself so this is like he's taking what any other comic colorist would have done in probably a much more two-dimensional way, and he's taking it to another level, I just a level you just don't see. And from the creative standpoint, Wayne, this is the one thing I think, there's not a ton of money in this business, and anybody who's in it understands that. Mm-hmm. But there is a fulfillment when you see something, and you know that all three of us have worked really hard to get done over a pretty long period of time, and you're holding it, you're reading through it, you're looking at it, and these images are bring everything to life in a way that you just never thought would happen. Mm -hmm. I cannot, I cannot express enough 
just the gratitude I have. I am a very fortunate guy to have these two guys on this book. Well, I have to agree oh, with you thanks, on that. Yeah, that's very nice. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, I have to say, because I work also on, a, on an independent comic with uh, my roommate. I mentioned it before, and it's like Christmas every time he gets the, the artwork in from the, the, his art team. And he just... You know, he's just kind of like, wow, every time he gets to see it. And you may have found this true, is that their ability to portray things sparks story ideas in you. Yeah. They, they may take you places that you didn't expect to go originally, just because their art made you think of something that you want to include. <laughs> yes. You know, I, before I, I'll, I'll shut up now, but Scott did that to us completely on Redneck Red, which is a different book altogether. When uh, Pat Batten and I were working with him on that, the very first issue he delivered, you know, our jaw drops. We're like, oh, man, this is way more, <laughs> way, way bigger than we thought it was going to be. And it just took the book in a different direction and it made it what it is now. So I completely understand what you're talking about. Well, that's cool. That's the way the creative process is, is that you think you have this wonderful story and then somebody suggests something that makes you change your mind about what you might be going to do, wanting to go in just a slightly different direction because how that made you think. And that's, that's, that. I agree, the artwork just, like I said, it pops off the page. It's just amazing to me. I just couldn't stop reading it when I, once I started. But, Mike, I've got a question about your choice of things. One of the things I noticed that you did a lot was that you had the characters looking off the page, as I talked with Scott about, their eyes look at us a lot of the time. I mean, Grotesque does that, the TV reporter does that, the minister does that, Joshua does that. All the people are looking at us a lot of the time, and that pulls us into the story because we feel like we're involved and we're standing there around these different characters. <laughs> was that a creative choice that you like to do, or was that something different that the script elicited out of you? How did that work, Mike? Actually, it was not a conscious choice, but uh, I'm glad that you... Uh noticed it. This is something that was just off the script. I mean, I, I tried to stick to the script as close as possible because I thought there was nothing to do but to draw it. There was a couple of times where I, I had to deviate from the script, but most of the time it was all the, in the writing. And I think this is just a testament to a good script where the artist doesn't really have to change too many things. I mean, it was just, it was just really great. It was written in a great way, and it was beautifully written, and it was beautifully illustrated. Well, there's one time in particular where Joshua is sitting there, and he's got his eye expression is looking at us, and you kind of see the whites of his eyes underneath, and you see the pupils. You only see a little bit of the pupils as if he's, his head is tilted looking at us. And I remember being spooked when I saw that. That was just an amazing panel on that. Because you don't expect that kind of image out of a, a character who is feeding on good something that's considered good. And so when I saw that, I was like, you know, maybe this the, the good thing isn't quite as good as it's cracked up to be. So uh, there was a lot of questions in my mind as, uh, as I was looking at your artwork and seeing how this uh, applied to the story. And of course, that I always think is when things go well, is when the artwork propels the story as well as it did with you guys did. And I just think I was just fantastic the way you did that. But after a while, though, I have to say, grotesque looking at me kind of unnerved me a lot. So I was, uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Why is this demon? Well, thank you for saying that. I should have just probably said, yeah, I meant to do all of that. <laughs> <laughs> now that I think about it. But, yeah, I mean, I feel the same way. I think it's great. The thing that drew me to this story was the addiction angle. I thought it was so original. You know, you have a superhero who is addicted to his powers, which I don't think that's ever been done. This is, you know, another twist on a superhero that is completely original and this was one of the main things that got me into this project very cool it's very well done go to the writer no, okay yeah because well i think your combination worked out real well and also with scott the th things i'm really kind of interested in too is your choice of color when he starts to his powers come on more strongly that he's white with kind of blue on there, which is kind of, it, it made us look like we could see him still, even though he was, you know, in real life, if a person was glowing, we would probably wouldn't see it. We would just see a white outline and a white in between. But I thought the choice of blue in there helped us see him and understand what he was doing when the powers were activated, which was really cool. And he's running through the street at one point, and all those good things are really great. As far as that goes, it's important. It was like Halo was back in The Outsiders. You could see her 
and you see the image, the outline around her. But it was great to be able to see the expressions and stuff like that and the way it was too. How did you choose the, like, to use the blue to outline his shape and uh, his expressions? I think that was mainly Mike defining his outline and then I believe really that came from Ben, his direction of this is how he wanted the character to be colored. Okay. Um, and I think that's how that came together. And then we added the little, the sparkly, whatever you call that. The, I think we call it the Star Trek, the motion picture <laughs> special effects on him. The, just the, the, like the lens flare stuff mm-hmm. um, afterwards. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I just, I think that was mainly Mike and Ben putting that together. And then I just kind of, colored it mm-hmm. i think well it turned out real nicely i thought that that uh, you know you're, you're making that happen really again made it stand out on the page which i really liked so i thought all that was good now i talked a little bit about the eyes but then your colors on like on joshua's face when he's feeling the goodness about being addicted you used a lot of different shades on his face that kind of accentuated the eyes which i liked how did you do that was that something you know, I'm always interested as to how, like, a colorist does these kind of things and make these things pop and understands what's the important part of the panel and focuses on making that happen. Those kinds of things, how did you decide, what, based on the script and the artwork, did you kind of figure which was the most important part and then focus the color towards that way? I think it just kind of goes back to Mike's approach to drawing it. And I just tried to kind of give it a, a more organic palette of colors based on the way Mike illustrates, which again, is I interpret it as being kind of a, it's sort of loose and rough and it's almost sketchy in places. And so I wanted to get the colors, you know, aligned with that. And so a lot of the different color choices, I think I wanted to be kind of sketchy too with mm-hmm. the color. Mm-hmm. Well, it worked out so well. I mean, the use of shadow and, and the use of color I just thought was great. Even the lettering of light breed on one place has a light around it, sort of a halo, which I really liked. So there was a lot of use of different ways of using color that I thought really helped and augmented the storytelling, which I really liked. So. Ben is an excellent letterer, by the way. Yeah, I was, was, was going to ask you about that because there is a place in which when Grotesque speaks – it's red he's got a red outline and then black and yellow lettering in on it which of course may yeah i can only imagine what that sounds like yeah yeah that's uh yeah i I, that one it took a while to figure out what to do with him because i wanted to have some sort of a some word balloons and that just felt different and that just happened to be what i landed on Mm -hmm. you know the lettering piece can wow, that can get mundane after a while, you know, when you're 130 pages into it, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, again, it's like Scott mentioned earlier, it's a, it's just a step in the process. It's a necessary piece that has to happen. So I just just did it, you know, without any real mm-hmm. necessarily, uh, I mean, some thought, you know, but not, mm-hmm. I'm not a professional letter or anything like that, but it, it got the book done, you know, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, another thing I wanted to ask about the book too is the fact that you've got these, Black pages with white text on it, which make the makes the white stand out. Now I, the choice of Bible verses was always interesting. It really fit what was coming, and I always liked that. And of course, that you you'd name each chapter with like a one word title, oftentimes, mm-hmm. which I like. I always think simpler is better when it comes to these kinds of descriptive things. So I I thought that was again another thing that really pulled me along because you'd see addiction, you think, oh, now what? Who's going to be addicted? What's going to happen? And then it's the main character, which, of course, was a surprise to me. I, I, I didn't expect that at all. So a lot of these elements, I think, came together to make a really terrific book. I really liked the book a lot. Which leads me to my next question here. As mm-hmm. Ben, as far as the future for this series goes, the, this was a, a collected edition that I got to see, right? Right, right. This is the uh, first story arc, which is Light Breed. It's the first five issues. So where do we go from here? Uh, is there a second storyline that's already underway? Uh, not yet. There will be, but not yet. Uh, you know, believe it or not, there are other stories, other characters that, uh, we'll be telling first mm-hmm. and we will be coming back to Midwalker mm-hmm. and he'll be a piece or a part rather of a larger story mm-hmm. as we go forward. But those other stories need to happen first. Okay. Those other characters need to be revealed first and it'll all come together, but it's going to be a slow process because resources are hard to come by. Mm-hmm. I mean, resources in terms of time, capital, talent, everything, because 
this is a, you know, a part-time endeavor, so it, right. it does take uh, it does take time. Right now, as far as the Fierce Comics universe goes, is mm-hmm. M- Midwalker tied to other titles in the Fierce Comics universe? That's an ongoing question that we we <laughs> every every convention we joke about it, laugh about it. If you ask Rob Ryan, the the creator and artist behind the Maniacal Smile. The first thing he'll point out is that all of his characters have three fingers and a thumb, or you know, four fingers. Not, not they're not five fingered hands, so they obviously can't be part of this universe. It mm-hmm. just doesn't make sense, you know. Mm-hmm. But we would love for them to be able to somehow come together in some sort of way for some kind of an event when the time is right, and we'll find a way to make that happen. You know, Redneck Red, can he exist in the same Midwalker existence universe? If you want to use that word, absolutely. Redneck Red's based out of the Everglades. Midwalker's based out of Tampa. The other book, Hoof and Horns, which is more along the lines of five-fingered humans, that could take place in the same universe. So we do have the ability to bring some of these together outside of the continuing larger story with other characters that I was just referencing. Yes, there are several that can come together. Of course, they could all go to a different universe where all these alternate realities could converge. And that'd be one yeah. way to do it. You, do, you don't necessarily yeah. have to have them all in the same, go back in their own individual universes or stuff. They could have that happen, which would make yeah. fun. Yeah, you know, though, it starts to sound like another DC Marvel-esque kind of thing. And honestly, I'm so tired of the uh, reboots and collisions and new universes. That whole piece of the business is just, to me, exhausting. Mm-hmm. I would rather try to make sure that the stories, because we're not putting out multiple issues per month we're not under that kind of pressure and don't have to deal with that so i'd much rather focus on understanding what the larger story is is you know where we're going with it how the different pieces fit in making sure that those individual books that are coming out to supplement and build up to that larger story making sure that there is the best books we could put out Mm -hmm. and building towards that larger overall story in a way that's going to be pleasing for the customers fans that are reading it Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of Fierce, well, let's start with Fierce, and then we'll get into each one of you individually and find out what you're working on. Ben, as far as like Fierce is doing right now, what can we expect to see from Fierce Comics in the next couple months? Okay, we have a lot. Uh, the things we can talk about are the first full story arc behind Hoof and Horns. That's a book written by Pat Batten. That's written. It's in the editing process now. We do have a very popular industry name. Um, that's going to be attached to that book okay. and from an editing perspective. Not really ready to release that yet, okay. but that's something. Keep your eyes on our website, on our social media outlets. We will make an announcement on that. I mean, you'll know them when you hear the name. That's going to be a big plus for us and for that book. That's the next four issue story coming out on our one off books, you know, yeah. where we'll put several issues out, then aggregate them into a trade. Our ongoing title, The Maniacal Smile. We just launched into the Banana Republic storyline, which is uh, four issues, and the first of those issues just launched at the Tampa Bay Megacon, and we're on a quarterly release schedule with that book now, Mm -hmm. and so that will be filling up this year, too, as far as uh, releases. And then we have our 20th anniversary for the Maniacal Smile coming up in 2018, so there's going to be a lot of behind-the-scenes work uh, uh, you know, happening that we are going to be putting in place for a large year in 2018 in support of the Maniacal Smile. Mm. So that's a lot of what we have going on in the background right now. Very good. Now, how about you as a creator? What things can we expect from you in the future? Well, the supplemental stories that are going to back up and build on the story that we're starting here with Midwalker. One thing you'll find is we're very, very conservative at Fierce. We don't announce a lot of things until we are really ready to pull a trigger on them. Because there's a lot of people in this industry that talk about all the projects they're doing. And 99% of them never actually come to market. And we don't want to ever be perceived in that way. Mm -hmm. So there are other stories being worked on, being built, but we're just not there yet in terms of being ready to announce them. Mm -hmm. Now, we will be running our second issue of Hearst Load of Horror, which if you haven't seen the cover to that book, if you think that some of Mike's illustrations in this Midwalker book are realistic, take a look at the cover of Hearst Load of Horror number one. Mm -hmm. I have had... More people than I can count tell me how almost creepy realistic that image is. Mm -hmm. And we have a pull-up display. And this is, Mike, I don't think I've told you about this yet, but we have one of those six-foot or seven-foot hall rollout pull-up displays that we had at Megacon Tampa Bay. And it's basically the cover image for Hearst Load of Horror. That image, Mike, the eyes on that image 
will follow you as you walk as you walk from one side of our booth down to the other it's like he's staring right at you the entire time i don't know how you did that but it is amazing i had more people point that out it was it it's just an amazing image an amazing right. image but we will be working on the next issue of that book for release next October. That's going to be our ongoing annual. So Wayne, I think I might've sent you a PDF of that one. You definitely want to take a look at that. That's okay. we're getting very, very positive reviews on that one so far. That's like our runaway hit all of a sudden. We didn't expect it to be quite as well received as it is. I mean, we thought it would go over well, but it's been over the top. We're given Mike's ability to draw eyes in this book i'm not terribly surprised by that i'm probably gonna be creeped out as i walk by that the next time i see you guys at a convention speaking of which before we leave you i'll just ask that one last convention update when will we see you guys at conventions next all right um right now we do have the ansi street free comic book day locked in we do have the clearwater library comic con locked in as for any other larger cons in 17 we haven't determined yet where we're going to go because we're probably going to go out of the state for a couple of shows as opposed to staying in state the way we've been doing for the last couple of years. And that gets expensive. So we have to plan that correctly. We have to find the right show with the right attendee count with the attendees that are actually there for comics, not for other things. And right. uh, so it takes some research and just keep your eyes on our website. We do announce them. We have a events area where you can go and see where we'll be, but we will be in other cons throughout the uh, year. Cause the reason I ask is because that's how I found out about you guys was to go into the con and seeing your booths over several times. And I expect I might have some more conversations with your creators in upcoming episodes here on, because this has been wonderful stuff. And I, I haven't been able to dive into the other books yet, but I will be because the, this one just is so great. And the, what I've seen of the others, I haven't had a chance to really completely read them, but they all are great to me. I think it's all wonderful stuff and variety too. Which I love in my reading. I just adore that. So good stuff. I'm glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. Now, Mike, has he mentioned the book that you're going to be working on next? Is that what's happened? Right now, I'm just doing something really small. It's um, We're probably going to print it ourselves, but it's it's too early to uh, say anything, but it's going to be pretty cool. Uh, I really like this one. And I can't really talk too much about it because it's in the very, very beginnings. Mm-hmm. How I would can, we... I mean, it can... Yeah, I don't have any social media or anything like that. Oh. I'm complete recluse. Which is really bad for artists because your name is your brand. I don't really do too good about promoting any stuff. I just kind of draw whatever comes along. Mm-hmm. But I think maybe I will change it up for the, for in the future, and I will put up updates. Maybe I get a Facebook. Because I was going to ask. That was the thing I was going to ask. How can we keep up with your stuff? You know, it's social media seems to be the way to do it. Maybe you can kind of work with Ben a little bit, and he can kind of help promote your stuff and, and maybe help you get a little start on to a level where you can oh, yeah, do no, this. Social media is great. I have nothing against. It. I I really like it. I just mm-hmm. uh, matter of getting it all together and just mm-hmm. sitting down and doing the stuff. But in which I don't know why I I haven't done it. But I have a website. I have a it's mikeshortcut.com and you can email me the old email which I don't think anyone does anymore. <laughs> um, this is the thing you speak of. <laughs> but I thought this, this, I think this project was, was amazing. Midwalker was really good. And the new stuff from Fierce was so much fun to work on. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know. I think I'm going to keep drawing while I still can. Because... Mm-hmm. Is for an illustrator in the comics to do that is not an easy thing. Right, it's pretty tough it's on your life. Right, but uh, that's all I'm gonna. That's all I can say. But uh, it's fun, and you know, what am I? Gonna, you know, I can't really not do it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's always gonna be some things. I'm gonna try to get them out as I can. Mm-hmm. That's it. Okay, well, because I love what you did here, and I'd love to see more by you. Have you done other books that we should be looking for? Maybe the thing to do is talk about if you've done stuff in the past that we could follow up while you're working on stuff in the present. Oh, well, there's too many things. You can just Google my name. There's so much stuff. Okay. I mean, <laughs> from the top of my head, I don't know. Here's is probably the best work I've ever done. Okay. It's hands down. I mean, there's some other stuff, too, but... I don't know. I don't know if that stuff needs to be promoted. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Promoted. Man. Get your name out there, man. I mean, you can just Google me and you can see all the stuff that I did. This is too much. I mean, there's like 12 years worth of stuff. Wow. 
I plan to keep the guy as busy as I possibly can. Well, that's good. Cause as, that, as much as I, as yeah. I can possibly afford to. Yeah. But, but yeah, without a doubt. I mean, he and Scott are definitely our number one go-to guys when we have anything coming out. And, you know, if they're available, if they have the capacity to do it or the willingness, you know, then we're all good. It's when they can't or, you know, there's other projects and, you know, just life or whatever gets in the way. Mm-hmm. Then we start looking in the rest of our talent pool to see who could be a fit. But from my perspective, these two are always a number one go-to because, you know, the quality is going to be there. The work ethic is there. You can count on, you know, actually finishing something. And uh, it's just a pleasing experience. Well, like I said, this is a wonderful book. So I think I got started in Fierce in a, in a good place. So I was happy about that. Now, sure. Scott, as far as your stuff, what are things that you're working on as far as the, what we can expect from you in the future? I'm not really working on anything. Okay. I'm kind of in the wilderness right now. I'm trying to learn how to paint. Okay. And I'm working on a manuscript I'm hoping to have finished this summer. Hmm. So, yeah, I've, been, I've kind of sort of shifted gears away from comics the last couple of years, hmm. but still keeping my toe in the water a little bit, you know, the, the work with Fierce and just some other miscellaneous odds and ends here and there. Mm-hmm. How do we keep in touch with you? Are, do you have a website as well? Are you on Facebook? I do. I, you can check out scottreadstudio.com mm-hmm. and you can also find me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on Twitter Instagram, I think that's it. Okay. Probably forgetting something, but... Okay. Um, probably we can look your name up and find some of the other stuff that you've done as well. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. Well. You can Google me and see a, a slew of things. Mm-hmm. Well, I love the book. I think it was just a terrific way to get acquainted with Fierce Comics and with you guys' work. And again, I highly recommend people get a hold of this book. And maybe, Ben, that's the thing to say. How would you get a hold of this book? What's the best way to get it? That's, it's funny you, you mentioned that. That right now the website's the best place. Okay. That would be the fastest way to get it. If you, unless you're in the Tampa Bay area, some of the comic shops you can find. Uh, well, Yancey Street Comics is one you can find it at. Uh, I do need to talk to Neil over at Emerald City, mm-hmm. but the website's the number one place, and that's something where your listeners could actually help out. So if if they would like to help a independent publisher, the one thing they could do that can make a big difference is go to your comic shop. And tell them you want to buy Midwalker from that comic shop. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to try to submit this through Diamond, which is the only distributor, really, in this industry. And not to get into the whole business end of this, but Mm -hmm. without that channel of distribution, the whole model, business model, just doesn't work. You have to have that mass distribution in place to be able to move through the volumes that you need to print to get the right price point to make everything work. And... Like I said, I don't want to get in all the business minutia, but that's a critical must-have piece. And for an independent publisher like Fierce Comics to get into Diamond is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. What helps is readers asking their shops and having those shops asking their Diamond rep to be able to source Fierce Comics books through Diamond Comics Distribution. And that's probably the one biggest ask that I could ask to pass down to your listeners. Okay. Sounds good. Now, let me ask you about digital, uh, Comixology, things like that. Comics Plus right now, we do have Comixology uh, in the works. It's set up, and by the beginning of the year, we should have the entire line card on Comixology. Oh, cool. So right now, it's Comics Plus, and in limited titles. And digital isn't as huge for us Mm -hmm. as it is for others, but we have had pops here and there, hit or miss uh, successes with the books from a digital perspective. But Comixology is the much larger digital distributor, and that's the one we're working to have in place before the turn of the year. Very cool, because I always like to say that, that there's a lot of great material or great product, if we want to use the industry term, out there mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't know about. And that's kind of what I spend a lot of time on this podcast, looking for those kinds of things. And I think your book is just one of those great hidden gems that people should be getting into. I think Midwalker is just, I can't wait for the future stuff. I think it's going to be really terrific. You know, so Ben, Mike, Scott, all this stuff is wonderful. I think you guys did a great job on this book. I can't wait to see more from Fierce and from you guys in the future. So please keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Wayne. Wayne, I just want to say thank you for doing this and for giving the small publishers a voice. And I think you're doing great work, and this is something heroic. Oh. I really think that 
Well, I appreciate that. I used to go to conventions to buy action figures and to buy comics, and I'd spend hundreds of dollars doing that. Now I go to conventions looking for stuff like your material. I'll go home and I'll rarely take home an action figure anymore. I will come home and I'll have a stack of books that I can't wait to get to to be able to read and look for quality stuff like yours so I can help promote it because I just think people need to know the good stuff that's out there like Midwalker and other things that uh, you guys are doing. I think people need to know these things because as great as I love my Long John's superhero stuff, I love variety and I think you guys scratch that itch really, really tremendously. So I can't wait to see more from you guys. Thank you. People need dramatic examples to shake them out of apathy, and I can't do that as Bruce Wayne. As a man, I'm flesh and blood. I can be ignored. I can be destroyed, but it's a symbol. Get the latest from the comics universe. News, interviews, previews, and reviews. Listen to the weekly Wayne's Comics Podcast so you can keep reading your comics. That's it for this episode. Be back next time. I'll have another great interview with an excellent comics creator. Something I'm sure you won't want to miss. But until then, keep reading your comics.